So welcome to another one of our uh, series entitled The Power of Pivoting, Managing Through a Crisis, the Hospital for Special Surgery's Experience with the COVID-19 Pandemic. Uh, I'm C. Ronald McKenzie. I'm an internist and rheumatologist at the Hospital for Special Surgery and the moderator for this session. So I have two guests today. Uh, one is Dr. Peter Fabrican, who's an assistant professor of orthopedic surgery at Weill Cornell Medical College and uh, has a career interest in um, uh, pediatrics and uh, sports medicine. And Dr. Evan James, who is a fourth year um, resident in orthopedic surgery here, who can tell us a little bit about uh, his experience with respect to um, the educational changes uh, that have been imparted as a part of the uh, response to COVID. So I wanna just begin with uh, Dr. Fabrikant. And Peter, maybe you could tell us a little bit about um, your sense of what uh, the hospital's response has had to be in terms of its education now of the residents and fellows. Absolutely. So um, our residents um, have all really stepped up and uh, done an incredible job on the front lines with uh, responding to the coronavirus alongside all of our medical staff. Um, but at the same time, you know, we expect them and, and they have uh, a desire to maintain their orthopedic education, their didactic orthopedic education. And so um, that uh, in the setting of COVID-19, that's really been providing some unique challenges. Um, and so we've really moved uh, a lot to remote learning um, platforms, uh, which have uh, provided uh, some challenges, but also have provided uh, a lot of advantages, uh, even uh, some unforeseen advantages over uh, even in-person learning. Are you aware of any other programs that are facing similar kinds of challenges? Sure, I think, I think every uh, you know, program, uh, orthopedics and otherwise, especially in the tri-state area where there's a high level of COVID is, is facing similar challenges. Um, I think one thing that we've been uh, fortunate is that um, our uh, information technology folks have really stepped up our digital um, platforms and being able to communicate remotely. So that's helped us with our education platforms as well. So rounds are still ongoing on a daily basis. Um, and uh, uh, Evan, you attend them remotely by a Zoom or Skype, Skype, for instance? Yeah, so the, uh, there's an opportunity to attend uh, rounds and lectures in real time um, through a live video stream that's available through uh, the HSS internet. Um, there's also an opportunity for people who are engaged in clinical work um, during the time of lectures or rounds um, to watch them at a later date, um, a later date or time as, uh, as their clinical duties permit. So can they be interactive? You can ask questions to the, the speaker, for instance? Yeah, they're interactive either through asking questions verbally or through a live chat that streams um, at this, uh, concurrently with the lecture. And you found it uh, pretty uh, useful? Yeah, I think for a lot of the residents uh, during medical school, we participated in um, a lot of our uh, medical, case, medical education was done remotely um, through lectures that were recorded um, that we could either watch in real time or stream at a later date. And so I think for a lot of us, this was a pretty seamless transition um, to something that we already had a lot of experience with as medical students. So Peter, something the audience might be interested in is of course, you know, uh, in, in the domain of surgery, there is the practical uh, aspects of, um, of what you do and learning to do surgery. So how is that approached um, in a setting like this? Sure, I think it's approached in a couple different ways. So um, from the, uh, dis a lot of surgery is decision-making and understanding anatomy and physiology and uh, structure and form and function. And I think a lot of uh, the advantages of the remote learning, like Evan just pointed out, um, can teach that. So for instance, if I'm giving a lecture uh, or, or we're doing a case presentation over um, Skype or Zoom or one of these other platforms, um, the residents can see my screen. I can give the residents remote control of my screen so I can say, show me where you would put this implant or show me how you would reduce this fracture. Where would you push? You know, where, where is this muscle inserting uh, or originating? And they can take the mouse and point it out to not only me, but the other learners uh, on the platform. So that's something that's, uh, 
that's been fantastic because you're essentially calling the resident up to the chalkboard to, to, show, to teach everyone else. As far as the um, manual uh, uh, kind of tactile aspect of surgery, that's obviously a big challenge because you know there's social distancing protocols and um, we, we certainly uh, like to implement our bioskills lab, but uh, sp certainly during the surge of uh, COVID cases, we, we had to dial that back. I think as we uh, plateau and start and the curve starts to come down, we can re-implement those. But I think that um, a lot of, again, a lot of um, surgical training is surgical decision-making, understanding the anatomy, understanding the concepts, and that's still very translatable on a digital platform. Okay. What about um, the anatomy classes? I don't know, perhaps Evan, you're finished, finished with that. I don't know how long that continues in your training. Yeah, definitely, as Dr. Fabricant mentioned, one of the big challenges with the COVID pandemic is um, continuing to progress in, from a technical standpoint in your ability as a surgeon. And so a huge uh, component of that is um, mastering anatomy and then learning how to translate that understanding of anatomy into implementing a surgery. And so I think from an intellectual standpoint, learning to think through, um, think through a surgery, um, learning operative indications, we've been able to continue that component of the, ed of the education. Um, as we've entered the more, um, this more critical portion of the pandemic, the part that has been curtailed is um, continuing to work on these physical skills that we have to master to become surgeons. So um, in the early stages of the pandemic, we were able to continue some of that through um, simulation-based training. Um, and now a lot of that simulation-based training has been um, transitioned to remote simula simulation-based training. So uh, there's different, different platforms available either through an app on your phone um, or online that we've been using. So Peter, perhaps you could tell the audience a little bit about the range of resources that are available to the trainees here. Yeah, absolutely. So I think once we, once we uh, obtain and record the content from our lectures and uh, physical exam videos and things like that, um, our academic training department uh, puts that up on what's called HSSE Academy, which was initially designed as kind of an outward facing um, platform to broadcast HSS content around the world but has also served really well as an internal resource for our trainees and our staff here in order to um, view that content. Um, and I'll, I'd actually defer to Evan to talk about kind of how he experiences that as a resident, but my understanding is they have a dashboard and, and they get the content pushed out to them uh, automatically. Yeah, from a resident standpoint, we've been using HSS eAcademy for years. Uh, this is something that we access routinely in preparation for the normal lectures that we have um, on campus. And uh, in response to COVID, there's been um, a tremendous amount of new content that's been uploaded that we've been able to access. Um, and the majority of that content is also public, publicly available for um, the community to access as well. Okay. So another subject that I thought I would bring up, it's been broached somewhat by other speakers on education here, is the role of the ACGME, which I understand you've been interacting with and, and doing some writing about. So can you tell us a little bit about that effort? Yeah, so the ACGME has offered residency programs guidance in how to transition medical education through the COVID pandemic. And maybe you could explain for the audience who they are. Yeah, so the ACGME um, is the governing body for residencies across the United States. And they govern not only orthopedic residencies, but also other surgical and medical residencies. And they provide accreditation um, for residencies to assure that they're providing appropriate clinical um, and surgical education. So throughout this pandemic, they've created this system of three different stages. Um, and I'll kind of briefly summarize what those stages are. Uh, in stage one, it's what's called business as usual. So it's for an orthopedic resident, it's providing clinical and surgical care to orthopedic patients and attending in-person uh, didactic lectures, doing in-person surgical skills training at Cadaver Lab. Um, early on in the pandemic, since New York was one of the early epicenters of this outbreak, um, we moved to stage two. Um, in which we were still doing orthopedic care, but a lot of um, our traditional roles and responsibilities changed dramatically. So we went from having fully staffed teams with multiple residents to kind of a skeleton crew to minimize exposure of indi individual residents um, to COVID patients. Um, and then also transitioned our orthopedic education to more remote, um, remote learning and more simulation-based training. Um, what we're in now is stage three, which is kind of an all hands on deck um, strategy where orthopedic residents are helping in any capacity possible. Um, many of our residents, for example, um, and myself included, have been doing internal medicine, taking care of these patients during this time. 
and the education has moved entirely to remote and virtu virtual training. Yeah, I think one other thing to add is that not only has that move to remote and virtual training, but it's essentially had to become optional because there's so much in the way of clinical responsibilities for the residents. And I think that one of the advantages of these um, electronic platforms is that you can record um, the, uh, the smaller groups because you end up with a smaller group of trainees, um, which has its own advantages in a lecture setting, which it makes it much more interactive and personal. Um, and then for those residents or trainees who can't attend because they have clinical duties, they, that content is recorded, placed on the internet like Evan alluded to before, and then they can download it on demand, they can view it on demand, and then that material is enduring. So they can go when they're studying for their boards or studying for the in-training exam if they want to review you know, elbow fractures, they can pull up the lecture on elbow fractures and revisit it. Yeah, another interesting thing that's come out of this is kind of coordination of educational content around the institution. And we're lucky here at HSS and a lot of other big academic centers, there's a lot of educational content being delivered on a daily basis. And um, one of the things that the Institute here has been able to do is help coordinate access for residents and fellows to that content on a daily basis. So a lot of us have been able to take advantage of even more stuff than we were able to prior to the pandemic. And that capacity then presumably will go forward, it, it be somewhat of an enhancement of the educational content here? Yeah, I think Dr. Fairbrickant summarized uh, this nicely. When, as a fourth year resident, I'm starting to think about preparing for my board examinations and then early on in clinical practice, uh, there's topics that I may want to revisit. And so this is content that I'll be able to access on demand um, in the months and years ahead. And, I, I, and sorry, just one other thing. I think that going forward, as we do return to a new normal, um, I think that, um, even if we do go back to in-person lectures, I think what this platform has allowed us to do is engage with residents who are off-site. So I think most of our residents are on-site here at HSS. There are some across the street at uh, you know, Cornell New York Hospital, some at Memorial Sloan Kettering, but some you know, who serve at the VA and some who serve um, in the outer boroughs. And one of the challenges in the past has been engaging you know, the entirety of the residency program with ongoing lectures. So even once we go back to um, a live in-person lecture format, this platform will allow us to broadcast you know, and record those lectures to residents who may not be on site. And I think that's um, a bit of a silver lining here as well. So, you know, it just occurs to me, do you think that um, HSS could uh, expand its um, sphere of influence across, uh, let's say, other orthopedic uh, residents and, and fellowships with this kind of uh, capacity? I think there's absolutely an opportunity to expand the educational footprint of HSS, um, not only during the pandemic, but also in the months and years ahead. Um, speaking to residents who are friends at other programs, um, their institutions have had to use similar formats where they've gone to um, remote virtual education um, during this time. And so I think it could be interesting to hear from um, surgeons around the country who are experts in uh, differing uh, in a variety of different domains um, and have educational content available from those experts. Yeah, I and I think that's especially true of smaller programs who may not have the infrastructure to sure. be able to build this out. Um, additionally, I know that um, some folks at HSS, uh, uh, some attendings at HSS have joined kind of multi-center webinars in educating orthopedic residents and fellows across the country. So I know our residents have tuned into to those sorts of webinars. Um, that have had our faculty and faculty from other institutions and our faculty have been able to teach, you know, residents and fellows from across the country. So I think this digital platform has really been helpful in that way. Yeah. A number of the different professional societies that we're members of have made their educational content free um, during this time. So a lot of residents have been able to access that content um, to greater ability, a greater capacity than they had before. Well, gentlemen, this has been very informative and thank you very much for coming. I think it's really added nicely to our discussion about the educational challenges that this uh, ep epidemic has uh, imparted to our institution and I think others as well.